There we go. Okay, Project 955 Bori SSBN subbrief. Let's start in the late 80s. Uh, why don't we start with this project is kind of fuzzy because we had to pick a time, we had to pick an event and said, I decided on 1988 for whenever they were gonna begin designing and building this scale test dummy to see if the Bori would perform as they expected. So I'm beginning in the late 80s, but you could go back to the late 70s when they began designing and testing the idea for the R39, a version of the R39 ballistic missile that was gonna be used on this submarine, but in the end ended up not being used. And that's why we're not starting in the 70s. But you could have if you wanted to. But because we're gonna focus on the platform itself, the submarine and the missile she ended up using, we're gonna begin in the late 80s. So the Rubin Central Design Bureau is the main design bureau that does a lot of the Soviet era and even today, modern submarines for Russia. They are the brains, the engineers, the naval architects, they write the drawings, they build these scale models and they test them. Project 955 begins when it is authorized by decree from the USSR Council of Ministers. The USSR Council of Ministers is like the executive branch of the Politburo. So the Politburo in Soviet Russia kind of is the people that make the decisions at the top, but the people who actually make those decisions happen is the USSR Council of Ministers. So once they decree that this decision will happen, it gets funded, people get to work on it. That happened in the late 80s with the decree to authorize Project 955 build this submarine. Okay, they used lessons learned from Project 941, NATO named Typhoon. Um, they didn't want to build a larger, or even another Typhoon 2. They wanted to go back to a more traditional design because they didn't need to build the largest submarine in the world again. They'd already done that. They've achieved that. Let's go back to a more conventional, you know, Delta style design submarine. Okay, so the Bark was the first missile developed and manufactured by Mikheyev Machine Building Design Bureau. It was 100% indigenous production and had a lot, to, that had a lot to do with why it failed. The, uh, the Bark missile was the original missile for this system and uh, they ended up not using it. And part of it was quality of the work, quality of the materials and the lack of supervision. Surprisingly, it wasn't the lack of money at this time. It was the lack of supervision and quality of work that made the R39 version of the Bark missile fail. Uh, delayed productions and failed missile test put this project in limbo. They continued with doing scale model testing, but they needed a new answer for who was gonna take over after the R-39 was decided to not be the next missile. So in November 1996, they do lay the keel for the first Bori class submarine. They give it name K535, name it the Yuri Dolgorki, and it's laid in Factory 201 of the Sevmash shipyard. It was originally going to be named St. Petersburg. Um, they even had the term Moscow for a short time, but they decided to go with Yuri Dolgurki instead. The St. Petersburg name ended up being used in a different project. And so there was some discussion as to who was going to get that name, and the other project ended up getting it. But construction was suspended within a year due to lack of funds. So now this is post-Soviet Union collapse. They have this pre-collapse project that they had been testing. Uh, and they did decide to try and build it in 1996, but they rapidly ran out of money at this point. All right, so let's talk about the R-30 Bulava missile. This is the missile that they would end up using. It is built by the Moscow Institute of Thermal Technology, or MITT. Um, they propose that they use the Bulava 30 or R30. Both those designations are the same missile. Uh, Bulava is based on a successful Tolpol M land based ba ballistic missile. This missile is already in production and is being constructed by the same people that are going to make this missile. I have to be clear that it's not a modification of the Tolpol M. This is a whole new missile being built by people with a long track record of successful land-based ballistic missiles. All right, so the Bulava has a couple uh, cool features. She has a hardened warhead that protects it from EMP attack. So if you can imagine, you know, warheads raining down from orbit, each nuclear explosion is gonna encompass an EMP pulse. 
So you don't want the very first nuclear explosion to disable all your other, you know, MERV warheads through the EMP pulse. So it's got EMP shielding around the warhead itself, so it will still function once it gets to its uh, detonation altitude. It has a variable reentry path, which means stage two and stage three uh, have maneuver nozzles on them, and they can shift their um, course mid-flight. This gives them the ability to also change their targets mid-flight. So they can launch with one target, and sometime before they release their bomb, their ballistically, they can change the target to a different set of coordinates. This is a new feature in Russian missiles. They hadn't had it before this missile. They also release a bunch of decoys, about 20 of them, with the release of the warheads. So each missile can carry up to 10 warheads and up to 20 decoys for a total of up to 30 projectiles coming out of one missile, you know, inside a, a target area. And this project 955 begins in 1998. Okay, so the Dmitry Donsky Typhoon Test Platform, you can learn more about this with our Typhoon subbrief from September 2019, if you want to go check that out. Uh, in December 2003, the Dmitry Donsky has the first throw test of the Bulava missile, which you see here. A throw test is simply where the test platform being the, the submarine is on the surface and simply ejects a shape that is the same weight and mass as the actual missile. But it doesn't have any fuel or any warheads or anything else. They're simply ejecting this thing into the air and letting it splash back down again. This test is successful. About nine months later, in September of 2004, they do a submerged test of the same missile body it ejects approximately 40 meters into the air out of the water. That's how powerful these ejection pumps are that push these missiles out of the missile tube and through the water into the atmosphere. It goes up approximately 40 meters. The next year in September 2005, they have the first successful surface firing of a Bulava missile with a mass simulated warhead, which means just an impact warhead. It has no actual explosive or radioactive features about it at all. Uh, but it does impact at the Curai range in Kamchatka Peninsula. So this first test is very promising because it works perfectly the first time. Uh, in December, a few months later, they do the first successful submerged launch. So they've done one surface, they've done one submerged, they've both worked. This is a great start. In 2006, things begin to change. It's not sure if anything changed in the manufacturing, construction, assembly, but something in their production line is different now because they begin to have missile failures. In 2006, they have three of them. They have a first stage missile failure and it falls into the Barents Sea. So something wrong with the booster rocket itself, that's solid state fuel. Um, in October of the same year, uh, they have a missile failure 200 seconds into flight, which would put it close to like stage three. Uh, it self-destructs over the Kara Sea, falls into the water, Every no, there, there's no, no injuries. And then finally, December, a few months later, they get another failing, this time certainly in the third stage, uh, and it self-destructs over water safely again. And what's different about this missile in the third stage than any other missile that they've had before? This one, submarine launch missile they had before, this one has the maneuvering nozzles, the maneuvering jets. So they believe there's something wrong with the guidance that allows it to maneuver in the mid-stage of its flight, stage three, uh, that is causing it to lose control. All right, so we had, they had a run of Bluva failures beginning in 2006 and continues through 2007 with some rather spectacular photographs taken from people in Norway. In 2007, a missile test was successful, but the MIRV did not separate from its carrier in flight. That's a big part of uh, the missile. You know, each warhead is mounted onto a, a carrier, basically, that aligns itself with the target. And when it's in the proper position, it simply releases the warhead. And that warhead from that point on is a bomb. It just ballistically drops onto the target, which can be thousands of miles away because they're so high up in orbit. Anyway, that thing didn't release properly, causing it to go off kilter and, you know, and miss. November 2007, a missile self-destructed 23 seconds into flight. That's definitely stage one failure. September 2008, this is the next year, uh, MERV warheads miss Kura range again. Now, this is kind of scary and that the missile was operational and it worked, it released its MIRVs, its independent reentry vehicles, uh, but they were never found. 
they go out to the Kara range and they're like, where are they at? Where'd they go? You know, hopefully they didn't go to Alaska or Siberia or hit somebody's farm, uh, but they lost them. It's not the last time that's going to happen either. Okay, November 2008, uh, a successful test of the R30 takes place, which is great. They're like, wow, after two years, we finally got one to work. <laughs> so everyone breathes a sigh of relief. Let's just take a look at the one that worked and just mimic that process from now on. And we should have them working from now on. Well, in December, the very next month, uh, the second and third stage fails in separating, destroying the missile in flight. Now, what connects these stages, one, two, and three, these rocket motors are explosive bolts. And in the case of the one in December, the explosive bolts between stage two and three did not explode properly, causing the second stage to not detach properly, causing it to not be the right mass and weight and shape, and it spun out of control. Uh, July the next year of 2009, the R-30 second stage rocket motor fails. Uh, the head of the Moscow Institute of Thermal Technology at this point resigns because in the last three years, four years, he's only had one successful missile test. So they've, they've had, you know, a really bad run and he's taking responsibility of saying, hey, you know, it's probably something in our construction process or our assembly process. All that stuff falls under his watch. So he resigns his position. In December 2009, this is the same year, about six months later, the, sturge, the third stage of the flight control fails, causing the missile to tumble at the top of its ballistic trajectory and causing a rather spectacular spiral effect over Norway. And so there you can see in the picture the spiral of it. And it was rather uh, interesting to get a photo of this. Uh, if you imagine a video of this, that spiral would actually be turning. Yeah. Uh, in real time, it, it was uh, spinning. And that was just the missile near the top of its apogee tumbling out of control. Uh, October 2010, the Dmitry Donsky conducts two successful firings of the R-30 missile in the same month. And they're, they're done at that point. They're like, okay, we got two in a row. We're going to move testing now to the Bori class. The very first haul is about ready. Uh, we're going to go ahead and shift testing over to K-535. All right, so let's go over Bori by the numbers here. The Bori is a two-hull submarine, displaces about 19,000 tons, and that is a rough estimate. It is a huge submarine. It displaces more than the American Ohio-class ballistic submarine with all 24 of its missiles in the submarine. It's even more than that, and this carries only 16 missiles. It's 170 meters long, so a little bit longer than the Ohio, but in a weird coincidence, it's the exact same width as the American Ohio, 44 feet, like to the T, same width. I don't know if there's something magical about three and a half meters, but, uh, you know, engineering wise, but maybe there is. All right. It's test depth is over 1400 feet or 450 meters. It does have a one OK 650 V reactor turning one screw at a and can maintain a power of 190 megawatts, which is a lot of electricity. Uh, it does have a horsepower of 43,000, 43,000 horsepower, and they claim they can push that through the water at 29 knots. Those numbers, if you take the total tonnage of around 19,000 and 43,000 horsepower, it is close to 40 or 29 knots rather. Um, so I'm going to take their word that that's right, but that's still awfully fast for a ballistic missile submarine, but it does have a lot of shaft horsepower. So we're giving them the benefit of the doubt on the speed here. Okay, single shaft uh, pump chip propulsion in the back. It has 16 R-30 ICBMs that should say SLBM, submarine launch ballistic missiles, technically different than an ICBM, but it does the same job. Each with 10 more heads, 20 decoys in each missile. Again, that's up to, it doesn't have to have 10. It can have one warhead and one decoy, but up to 10. It has eight torpedo tubes all facing forward and carries up to 40 53 centimeter weapons. And we don't just say torpedoes anymore because whenever you talk about 53 centimeter, that could be land strike missiles, anti-ship missiles. It could be a mine. Uh, it could be a 53 centimeter decoy, you know? So just any, up to 40, 53 centimeter devices in the torpedo room. Just above those eight torpedoes are six other 53 centimeter tubes above the bow. And those each carry countermeasures. So they have external tube countermeasures that cannot be reloaded at sea, completely external, and they have a torpedo room of eight torpedo tubes. 
has over 100 crew, which is a lot for a Russian submarine, but this is a big girl. And uh, they can go to sea for 90 days, which is realistic. All right, so some of the equipment here in the Bori, they have the new MGK-600 Bravo sonar system. This is the newest sonar system in the Russian Navy. It's very capable because they can buy the same computer products that the American and NATO navies buy and Chinese Navy buys. Uh, so we're all working with the same hardware now. They've caught up. Uh, what's different is the software, and that's where the beam forming happens. That's where the magic happens. That's where the fidelity of your sonar system happens. So they haven't quite caught up on the software side, but there's not much keeping them from even becoming better than NATO nations on the software side. So we'll see. They do have the large bow sonar array, which uh, is the same type of sonar array on the new Virginia class, similar to the one on the Sea Wolf. Uh, it allows for higher resolution on the bow sonar arrays. The, the array itself being as big as it is, allows them to beam form in higher fidelity. So that's presumably what they're doing. In other words, the sonar system is probably pretty good. It's probably comparable to NATO nation, fourth, fifth generation sonar systems. Uh, pop-up rescue chamber like previous boats. Uh, Russians are big on their pop-up chambers, which is great for the crew and crew morale. And they also have a crew sauna. This one doesn't have a hot tub like the Typhoon had, but they have a crew sauna, which is great. It looks like you could fit, you know, two sailors comfortably, three sailors in a tight fit there. Pretty cool stuff. All right, so the Bori SSBN has eight compartments. The first one is the sonar array. You see a picture of it there. Uh, we're working our way forward to aft. So number one is all the way forward. Behind that is the central post, berthing, ship's equipment, the ship's batteries there, and all the medical areas are in that number two compartment. Uh, number three is the combat post, which is their way of saying the control room where they operate the submarine and the systems. The combat post is there. Uh, diesel generators and HP air systems and compressors are in compartment number three. Compartment four and five are both missile compartments. Uh, they are subdivided, you know, into watertight compartments. So you could lose one missile compartment, have it be flooded, and the other one be completely dry. And if you had enough buoyancy, still operate. Uh, compartment six is the reactor and steam generators. Seven is where the main engine is with the turbine that turns the shaft and all the seawater systems um, related to cooling that and keeping that working. And then behind that, all the way at the rear end, the aft end of the submarine is the hydraulic and rudder stern plane drives back there, keeping control and pitch of the submarine. All right, 2003, construction resumes on Project 955. Remember, construction was suspended in 1997. Uh, here we are, what, four, seven years later? Uh, bringing it back online again. Factory 201, she's still sitting there. Uh, they're going to, to save money, they're going to use parts from K337 and an unfinished, upgraded Akula SSN. So parts of the Akula are going into the Yori Dolki. Uh, in 2008, the Yori Dolgurki uh, K35 is launched and the reactor started pier side, 2008. And the Yuri Darkolki is known as the founder of Moscow or Yuri the Long-Armed. I wanted to talk a little bit about Yuri as I didn't know who he was. Why is this guy getting named after a submarine over uh, instead of like St. Petersburg or Moscow? So what did Yuri do? Well, back in the 12th century, Yuri for a very short time, I'm talking like three years, was in charge of the province where today's Moscow is. And he is responsible for fortifying that village into what is Moscow today. And he also put a palisade and a um, rampart and a, a wooden wall around that village as it became a larger city and eventually the capital of Russia. You know, so he was the responsible the guy responsible for making that happen. He did that in a short time, like I said, three years before he was promptly poisoned by somebody uh, in a straight up, you know, <laughs> Game of Thrones style dinner. And uh, you know, life went on in Russia. So if you're interested in that kind of political intrigue, 12th century Russia, give or take a couple hundred years, is a great read. I recommend you guys look that stuff up because it reads like real life Game of Thrones treachery. All right, here's Yuri, um, K535 being christened. And uh, that's a nice shot of her in the dry dock. After the christening, she's rolled out into the dry dock there. She's still not operational. She's just out of the workshop and into the dry dock. That's what happened. They'll eventually flood that dry dock and she'll be in the water pier side, as we see here. In 2009, sea trials begin. 
uh, in the White Sea. The White Sea is that little body of water that's right outside Sev Mash, but south of the Kola Peninsula. 2011, the first firing of the Bulava missile is successful. So their decision to move testing to the Bori seems like a good call because their very first shot worked. Uh, shot from the White Sea, it hits the Kamchatka missile range, um, you know, thousands of miles to the west or east, rather, and it worked. Uh, December 2011, this is a couple, a little bit later, the first Salvo launch of two Bulava missiles is successful. So not only does she do one, she does two now. In July 2012, Sevmash declares sea trials complete, Sevmash being the shipyard, the construction part of this project, uh, and state audits begin. State audits begin. Now, state audits may have been done in the past, but this is the first time they've been very public about, we're not just going to accept any submarine that the shipyard builds and says it's ready to go after sea trials. Once they say true sea trials are done, state third-party people that are not involved in the construction process come in and they do an inspection and they make sure that everything is operating the way it's supposed to be. It's just another check to make sure that they're not receiving something that's broken. All right, so here's the Yori Dolgorki's survival suit and survival pod or rescue pod. You can see a lucky volunteered uh, crewman putting on his rubber survival suit with his hoodie on it. He's got a little bit of breathing apparatus there because presumably as you're floating around in the Barents Sea in the middle of December, if you're not bumping your head against ice, you know, you're going to be in very cold water. So he's going to be wanting to breathe warm air. And he's got that. So we got a few photos inside the rescue pod as well. with The crewman looking up throughout the hatch and uh, the little seats that they have with uh, some survival gear and food and water that are kept inside the pod in the case of an emergency. What I would like everyone to look at is look how big and bulky this survival suit is on a sailor and look at the size of the hatch they have to crawl through to, to escape the pod. So if you're a bigger gentleman, you may have to be get you may have to get real creative on how you're going to get out of this pod. That's not it's not a very big hatch, with that large bulky survival suit on. All right, some more pictures from the interior of the Yuri Dolgurki. Again, big credit to Saturnax for all of these. Uh, you can see the captain or some kind of officer operating the periscope. A quick note about that periscope: that is what we call in the U.S. Navy an attack periscope. It has basic functionality. It has a very small head that penetrates the water, so it's low observable. And it has the basic function of just sending the bearing that it's looking at to the fire control. So they can look at a target like a ship or something, or even an airplane, hit a button that's on the black handles there, and it pings that bearing to fire control. So fire control can mark on his display in this direction at the range that the captain says, it's at his discretion, is a contact. There is another periscope, this is why I bring this up, that is not photographed here, that does a lot of other things, including satellite communication, uh, GPS, uh, ESM, you, you name it, uh, it does it. It's got all the bells and whistles. And of course, we don't have a photograph of that because it's secret. But this is not the main periscope is my point. This is the attack periscope they would be using if they were doing a slow approach attack on a surface target. Okay, uh, there's got some crew birthing, uh, the crew head right there. Uh, with some instructions on how it works. I looked carefully at those instructions and it's exactly the same as an American 688 boat. It's funny how uh, some things are so simple, they just work no matter what country you're from. A toilet is one of those things. <laughs> and over on the right, you see the mask that the crewman is wearing. Um, I've been told it's called a rebreather, but it does have an air hose to it to supply the crewman with oxygen. We have these on 688s. Every submarine has these masks. But on Russian submarines, every crewman is required to be wearing this mask in a orange canister um, on their hip uh, with a strap over their shoulder. So every time you see a picture of the crew walking around inside a submarine, you'll notice this orange device on their hip. That's what's in the device. It's this rebreather mask. And down the line drawing, looking at the bow of the Yuri Dolgorki, you can see all the torpedo tubes. There's eight of them on the bow. I wanted, to, I wanted you to notice the arrangement is uh, two horizontal with two vertical on both sides for a total of eight. And then the little U-shaped ones that are more aft from those, that, those six are the decoys. They're all 53 centimeters. The reason why they look like they're different shapes is because it's a rounded hull and uh, you're watching it on a flat drawing. So they look like they're different sizes. They're not. They're all 53 centimeter. 
Okay, here's the operations room. You can see they're talking with President, or it could be Prime Minister, depending on the year. Uh, Putin there doing some kind of video teleconference. Um, something we'd like to point out with this photograph is the wide range of technology. You got some early 90s or mid 90s technology with the main consoles and the displays and the buttons and the microphones. That's all very old, but mixed in with that is a very relatively modern Dell laptop. So <laughs> you got a little bit of old and a little bit of new. It just gives you an idea of how long this submarine has been in development under construction. All right, let's go to January 2013. Uh, September 13 arrives at the permanent base of Sedea. Uh, that's in the Murmansk region. She's going to be part of the Northern Fleet. She'll be doing her patrols in the Barents Sea and the Arctic Ocean under the ice. That's where she's going to do her job. Uh, December 13th of the same year, just a few months later, she goes back to the shipyard at Sevmash for scheduled maintenance. Uh, nothing goes wrong. Everything is fine there. But uh, by the next year, by July, she um, participates in Navy Day parade of the ships at Severmorsk. So that's right there by the shipyard, by the way. It's like the city that the shipyard's at. So she didn't have to go very far, but she takes part in it. She puts up all of her flags and you know, people can come visit her, at least take pictures of her topside. Uh, October 2014, she does have the first test of the Bluva missile as a, as a operational SSBN. This is what makes this another first, is that before her missile tests were as a non-operational SSBN, now she's officially part of the Russian Navy, operational, doing her job, and she's now doing her first test under those conditions. And it works, very successful. That's in 2014. September 2016, she attempts a Salvo test of two Bulava missiles as the operational SSBN. The first missile, as you can see on the right-hand side there, goes straight up, is successful, hits the target in the Kanchaka Peninsula. Very well done. The second missile, something happens as it comes out of the water, causing it to veer off to become nearly horizontal to the water for just a second before the booster motor does ignite and manages to pull itself up into a vertical climb over the, um, over the submarine that's launching it. The submarine is submerged at this time. So uh, the missile does overcorrect as it tries to come back vertical again and ends up uh, going off course enough to initiate a self-destruct, which is uh, the top picture there. The second missile in the Salvo destructs itself uh, during the um, first stage, at the end of the first stage. All right, Yuri Dolgurki operations areas. Um, so whenever we talk about white sea testing, that's what the green box is. That's the white sea. That's the testing area. A lot of tests are done there because it's very difficult for us to get our submarines in that area. Uh, the live fire range, the red box, that's where a lot of the annual training happens, including live fire testing. I've spent part of my career in that red box. Uh, when I wasn't in the red box, I was in the orange box is, and that's where we look for the SSBN patrols. Uh, that's where we find them too. <laughs> so that's, that's not, um, Again, those are generalizations, of course, but you know, if you're if you're looking for a Russian SSBN, start where those orange boxes are. You have a good chance of finding something. All right, June 2017, a successful missile test is done, so they're back to being positive again on the 50/50. Will it work? Will it not? In May 2018, they successfully launched four Bulava missiles. This is a huge victory because they got four to go off at the same time. They all hit the targets. So May 2018, they appear to have the Bulava system working properly. I mean, four missiles is a lot. Uh, July 2019 is part of the Navy Day's parade of Severmorsk. So she goes back to uh, where she was made and uh, puts up the flags and becomes uh, a poster child for the Russian Navy for that year. Uh, August 2019 does another successful launch of Bulava missile from the Barent Sea to the Kaura firing range. The Barent Sea is where the red box is. So she would have been firing out of that. Uh, in 2020 to today, as of the time of this recording, she is operational. She's working out of the Murmansk region, which is that Kola Peninsula there. And she uh, conducts ballistic missile patrols, uh, presumably in those orange boxes. All right, let's talk about Hull 2, the second in the Bori class, K550. This is Alexander Nevsky. Uh, March 2004, Kiel laid as part of the unfinished Akula K333 links. 
Again, this is another upgraded Akula that was never finished, but it had a name and it had a hull number, K333. And they took the parts from that into, into the shipyard and modified them to fit this Bori plan. And they gave her a new name, K550. December 2010, she's launched from dry dock. Prime Minister Putin is in attendance for this. Uh, February 2012, she passes sea trials and the missile tests begin. September 2013, a Bulava missile test fails during minute two of flight. So that's probably second stage failure. Uh, all Bulava tests are halted at this time for this one submarine, barring an investigation as to why this Bulava missile continues to fail in 2013. November 2014, a successful launch of the R-30 missile from the Barents Sea into the Kara Range occurs. The investigation is over. The results are not public, but they had another successful test, so maybe they fixed and found whatever it was. The next year, September 2015, she arrives at Kashnikov Bay and joins the Pacific Fleet. So they have one in the Northern Fleet now and one over in the Pacific Fleet now. In 2016, she conducts her first strategic patrol in the Pacific Ocean. She deploys for up to 90 days once a year now, and that has become her routine. She's not a test platform like the Dmitry Donsky is. Uh, she's not testing as many missiles as the uh, Yuri was doing. She is a truly operational ballistic missile submarine. K551, the third ship in this Bori class, the Vladimir Monomach. 2006, the keel is laid using hull segments from K480, another Akula that we're going to recycle into these projects. And now is the time I want to talk about the sale. I'd put this question out to you guys on the Patreon page as to look at the sale closely. You can see the sale kind of leans forward from the top, giving it a forward cant or a forward slant. And ask you guys what you thought about that. And you guys had some great answers and got it right. Um, the Official answer is from deepstorm.ru is that it in increases the efficiency of hydrodynamic flow through the water. So it makes it more efficient somehow having that slope. Also, this is now my opinion. We're going to shift into my opinion now. Because they're reusing parts of the Akula that have a rounded sail, like you see here on the right. See how round it is? They had to reinforce that, add you know components and metal to it to make it stronger. Uh, for breaking through the ice because these ballistic missiles can be shot from a surface position through the ice. This gives them a strategic advantage when they're on patrol. They can be under hard ice pack, get the call to launch their missiles. They can surface through the ice, drive forward through the ice, breaking the ice apart, exposing the missile batteries that are behind the sail free of ice, essentially like an ice breaker. And they do that with this old recycled sail from the Akula, and the only way they could do that is by giving it a forward cant with that uh, sail reinforcement. So that's my theory on it. Uh, take it for what it's worth. The official story is it gives it better flow through the water. Okay, December 2012, she's launched. September 2013, no R30 test will be attempted during the investigation. Remember, uh, the previous hull had the failure. They suspended all test for the Bori while well, they suspended it for this one too. Uh, in June 2014, sea trials are authorized to begin. Sea trials involve many other things other than just missile testing, so they are allowed to do that. September 2014, they do successfully launch one Bulava missile, and it does hit the target at the Kara range in Kamchatka. Uh, December 2014, it becomes operational. November 2015, she launches a salvo of two R-30 missiles, but miss the targets in the Kara range. They go out to the Kara range, you're like, hmm, there's no new holes in the ground out here, comrade. Where'd the warheads go? Uh, they don't know. Whenever these things miss, they don't have the ability to tell where they went. <laughs> All they know is they didn't go to the range that they were supposed to go to, which seems crazy to me. Anyway, September 2016 arrives. <laughs> she arrives at Kanchakov Bay and joins the Pacific Fleet. So now we have two of these ballistic missile submarines over on the Pacific side of Russia. In 2017, she enters her strategic ro rotation with K550 deploying for up to 90 days at a time, and she uh, rotates with her. K551 does a patrol, K550 does a patrol, and they're kind of alternating now. Okay, K549, Prince Vladimir, Project 955 Alpha 
Bori Alpha. So this is a new project. I've included it in this subbrief because it is a continuation of Project 955. So we might as well get all these you know, together. In July of 2012, the keel is laid uh, without using any previous structures. And this is why we're calling it a new uh, type of Bori. This is, this is how we got the Bori A designation, is everything from the ground up is new, and the metal that they're using for the hull is a composite metal. It's not just steel anymore. It's not just titanium. It is a blend of multiple metals now. I don't know what the blend is. It's secret, but it's supposed to be really good. And she was actually launched in November 2017. So that gives her plenty of time to do sea trials and whatnot. In 2018, she begins the sea trials. October 2019, she launches her first Bulava R-30 missile, and it was a success. They're very good at getting their first missile shot right. And maybe that's because it's the first time they're doing it. Everyone's being very careful. They're double-checking everything that they're doing, and they're getting that first one right every single time. Uh, November 2019, uh, torpedo test in the White Sea are complete. Remember, I showed you the, the White Sea box. Um, in January 2020, shortcomings are identified during a state audit of sea trials results. Remember, I told you how they would come down with that third team, and they're going to audit all the results of the sea trials. They're no longer taking the shipyard's word for it as they used to, presumably. They're coming down and they're checking. Uh, in February of 2020, this is just a few months ago, the head of the United Shipbuilding Corporation, which is SEVMASH, which is the people building this thing, Alexander Ramakov, Mon, said that K549 will be handed over to the Navy by March 2020. Well, as we sit here recording this, it's April 2020, and it still hasn't been handed off. And the Russian Navy has made a short media statement saying that K549 will be operational when the shortcomings identified in the audit are corrected, period. They didn't expound on anything. They didn't tell you what the shortcomings were. Uh, this is a first build of this submarine technically because there's changes in it that do not exist in Project 955. So it is likely that they have some you know, growing pains, some problems, some new problems that they haven't seen before because this one is so different. I do want to mention the photograph in the top right-hand corner real quick. If you notice, it looks like there's some kind of crane on the bow. A lot of you may be asking yourself, what is that? That is called the fishing pole. And what it is, is it has a hydrophone, a sonar hydrophone array on that crane. And they will submerge with it. And they'll do a low speed, five knots, with the crane submerged, mounted on the bow. And that crane will extend and pivot around the submarine, taking sound measurements, seeing how loud this the submarine is. And they all do this now. All the new constructions do this now. What this does, this gives them a more accurate sound measurement without the risk of using another platform, whether it's a research surface vessel with a tow array or another submarines like the Americans do it. Uh, there's no risk of collision with a crane that's mounted on your bow that you're driving yourself from the command post inside the submarine. So this is how they do sound trials now with their new builds. They go out in the White Sea, they submerge, they with this crane steer this big hydrophone array around the ship, getting very close to the ship. Ideally, you wanna take these measurements at about one meter. So obviously you don't wanna have another submarine within one meter of you. You can get those measurements safely by craning a sonar array within one meter of you. So that's what they're doing now. It's a pretty brilliant idea. That's off to them for actually doing it. All right, Prince Oleg, Project 955 Alpha. Again, all new construction. Keel laid down in 2014, Sevmash Shipyard. All of these are being built in Sevmash Shipyard, by the way. General Isumus Suravo. Oh, I messed that up. Suravov. <laughs> anyway, the next submarine is uh, built in December 2014. Keel is laid. That's not built. So, But this is interesting that they laid two keels in the same shipyard, um, not necessarily side by side, but within the same year. And uh, so they're, they're progressing, you know, on multiple ships at the same time, including these two. Emperor Alexander III, which is Project 955 Alpha, uh, was keel was laid the following year, December 2015. And Prince Pazharsky, Project 955 Alpha, was laid in 2016. So Sevmash shipyards, 
very busy right now building four ballistic missile submarines at the same time, just at about one year intervals approximately. And they plan on having these operational, um, you know, as soon as they're as soon as they're done. The original plan, the original Bori of three, are already operational. This new Project Nine Five Five Alpha is going to have seven when when they're done, for a total of ten of these ballistic missile submarines that will then be the ballistic missile submarines for Russia for the forecoming decades, for a long time. So they're going to be uh, done building these after the tenth one. So my final thoughts on the Bori class um, project, Project 955, 955 Alpha, is the submarine is a very quiet, reliable ballistic missile platform. You put your missiles on this thing, they're going to be safe. They're not going to catch on fire. The submarine's not going to sink. Uh, the submarine is surprisingly quiet. It's very fast for a ballistic missile submarine, if we believe their numbers. And I don't have any reason not to, so might as well. It's a very advanced design. It's got bow planes on a... Uh, on a ballistic missile submarine. I don't know too many other countries that do that. Uh, let's see, Bori is the future sea-based as part of the nuclear triad. Yeah, because the nuclear triad is land-based nuclear weapons. And then you have air-based nuclear weapons. The third leg is the sea-based nuclear weapons. Well, all of the sea-based nuclear strategic weapons, okay, strategic, are going to be launched from these Boris. Now, we have other unconventional weapons like the uh, like Canyon 6 and tactical nukes. Those are not in... That's not in the equation that I'm talking about. As far as submarine launch ballistic missiles go, they're all going to be on the Boris. So the R-30 missile, let's talk about that. Uh, it still has reliability problems, especially with its third stage guidance. By adding the maneuverability in second and third stage, they reduce the reliability of the weapon to what I'm told is about 60%. Again, that comes from uh, the Russian Ministry of Defense source. So take that for what it's worth. It may actually be lower than that. I don't know. But that's what they're saying. And still, the way they're going to get around that is they're just going to launch two missiles at, at one target. And uh, that gives them like 120% probability. I was like, I don't think you understand how probabilities work, man. That's not how that works. <laughs> but I wasn't going to argue with them. But the idea is, is they have more warheads than they have targets. So they can easily double up on targets. And that's their plan. That's how they're going to overcome this reliability problem is through numbers. They're going to shoot multiple uh, warheads at each target. One of them will work. That's all it needs when it's nuclear warfare. Let's see, the R-30 is a good missile, has good missile counter defense measures. This is true. Uh, you know, the fact that it can change targets in flight is a huge, huge advancement. And then the fact that it can dodge incoming anti-satellites uh, weapons and, uh, you know, anti-ballistic missiles like THAAD, uh, which is the popular American one right now. But there's others other than THAAD, by the way. You know, it can actually... Those systems rely on the ballistic trajectory of the bomb. Well, that a large part of the flight isn't ballistic. So the fact that they can dodge and maneuver in and out of THAAD coverage is, is a big, big plus for this weapon. It is MP shielded, which is great. Uh, MP shielding has been around since the 50s. That's nothing new. Uh, but hey, they have it. And each missile carries up to 20 decoys, which is awesome because whenever you launch you know, from one warhead, you get 30 returns on your radar screen. Which one are you going to destroy with your 16 missile THAAD battery? You know, you can only kill about half of them. You better get all 10 or at least 60% of the 10 that are going to work as they come down on you. So the decoys add a lot of variability into the uh, counter measures.